Hey tea heads, this is Don from Mayleaf. In this video, how to make the perfect kombucha. Yes, yes, yes. I know you've probably seen many of these videos before on YouTube, but this one is going to be different. We are going to deep dive into kombucha making with Adam from Jar Kombucha. Jar Kombucha is one of the biggest and best kombucha producers in the UK, and Adam has dedicated many years into crafting the perfect kombucha. For those of you who don't know, Mayleaf Tea are tea educators and tea curators. Every week we release tea educational videos on YouTube and we taste many hundreds of teas every single year to curate the pinnacle teas for our clients worldwide. So we receive lots of questions about tea and kombucha is very high up on the list. We've been experimenting ourselves with making kombucha, so I have my own ideas about how to make the best kombucha. And I'm very excited to announce that Jar and Mayleaf are going to be collaborating on some spectacular top level kombucha, which is going to be exclusively available at the Mayleaf Tea House in London. More about that later. Let's go and meet Adam and work out how to make the perfect booch. Here we are in a tranquil Hackney Wick in London. It's a vibrant area. There's going to be planes overhead. There's going to be a bit of noise, but that's what you get when you're filming in London. I'm here with Adam. Thank you for joining us, Adam. Thanks, man. Adam is from Jar Kombucha. Why don't you introduce yourself to everybody out there? Hey, guys. My name is Adam Vani, and I'm one of the founders of Jar Kombucha. We are a kombucha brewery based here in Hackney Wick in East London, where we brew and bottle and package everything by hand with a small team. So looking forward to showing you guys around today. Yeah, yeah, definitely. We're excited to be here. And as I said, we've got a special collab that we're doing at the moment. We'll tell you more about that in a little bit. But this video is all about the basics of what is kombucha, give us a little bit about the history of kombucha, and most importantly, how to make the perfect booch. So, first of all, what is kombucha? So kombucha in its most basic sense is fermented tea. Uh, it's made classically speaking with tea, water, sugar, and a SCOBY. And a SCOBY is an acronym for a symbiotic culture of bacteria and yeast. And these ingredients are brewed together and they're left to ferment in a warm environment for around two weeks, eventually leaving you with a delicious nutrient dense drink. Okay, and the history, when did, when did this all start? Chinese, obviously, yeah, right? Yeah, it is actually from ancient <laughs> China around 2000 years ago during the Sin Dynasty. And kombucha was probably created by accident, at least initially, in that somebody left a pot of tea that yeah. was probably sweetened with some form of honey at the time that was the only available source of sugar. Uh, and wild bacteria and yeast kind of swept through this area and coated this jar, this pot of tea, in a layer of mold, which was essentially the world's first scoby. Now someone was brave enough to taste this, to drink it, yeah. to continue propagating the culture and eventually uh, we're left with what we brew today. So just like most things in life, discovery by accident and then bravery to just try it yeah. and see what, it, what exactly. it's like. So it's a natural, just the natural sort of molds in the air, the natural. Yeah. Okay, cool. So that's your basics on what is kombucha in the history. But of course, we want to find out how to make the best kombucha. So what are the ingredients that you need? Let's start with the basics and then go deep. So, uh, of course, the most important thing to start with is water. Uh, you want to make sure you're using filtered water. London water or tap water can often contain chlorine and chloramides and fluoride and stuff like that yeah. that your SCOBY doesn't really like. So mm. we're going to start with filtered water. Um, we're going to steep tea, which is obviously an integral part of the brewing process. And tea provides the nutrients uh, for the SCOBY as well as the flavor for the kombucha that you're left with after about two weeks. Um, and then sugar, which is extremely important. And the sugar that we're using is organic cane sugar. Now it's quite refined. Um, I'm not sure if you can see these granules of sugar here, but basically these, uh, they don't contain many minerals. So mm. the sugar acts as food or fuel for the fermentation. The yeast gobbles that up yep. and works with the bacteria to convert that into beneficial acids. Uh, so it's really important that you use the right sugar. And then most importantly, actually, is the SCOBY, and that's the symbiotic culture of bacteria and yeast. And here at JAR, we use a liquid version of the SCOBY, which is basically kombucha that we've already brewed for a couple weeks. And we're going to use a quarter of that for the total volume of our brew. Today, we're going to do a one liter brew, so we're using 250 mils of SCOBY. Okay, so let's just recap that. I've got some questions for you. Obviously, water, very important. The whole thing here is protecting the health of the SCOBY, right? Yes. Making sure that you produce the right environment for the right balance mm -hmm. of bacteria yes. right because that's sometimes where people can go wrong if they get the wrong temperature or they just sort of mm. get the balance wrong you can start mm. to develop undesirable exactly. bacteria and molds right so water very important tea obviously very close to my heart okay 
and we have done personally I have done many experiments with brewing my own kombucha we have tried lots of different teas my sort of you're using uh, an organic oolong green oolong and green tea that's right? right yeah so obviously you can choose any type of tea it's very important that you use tea right you can't really make kombucha without that's actually a common misconception yeah. you can make kombucha with basically anything that you can steep in hot water you can ferment but over time really that's so true, all yeah. tisans could be used yeah you can use basically these fig leaves that we have around us we recently picked fresh steep those in hot water and made a fig leaf kombucha nice i but like to dispel myths yeah but it's not the classically brewed form of kombucha and does the scoby stay healthy that's a good question and the truth is over time the scoby will degrade because okay. it needs the nutrients and the minerals from the tea in okay. order to stay healthy over a period of time so you can sort of brew tea kombucha for a while get it healthy and then use it for a few Exactly. brews of other herbal tisans. There yeah. you go, top tip for you. All right, so you're using a green oolong and a green tea. Yeah. Now, of course, at Mayleaf, we have these sort of pinnacle teas and we have been experimenting with them. My advice, if you want to go into the super high-end level teas here, is that there's, that you reach a sort of point of diminishing returns, right? There's no point in you using your top level Dan Song teas, you know, solely for brewing kombucha. What I recommend <clears throat> is you take some good quality teas like this that you act as that act as your base teas and then add some of those really amazing teas in there to give flavor. I have to say it does make a difference. You will taste those teas in the final brew, but obviously it's going to be very different to brewing fresh because it's gone through that fermentation process. Sure. So my advice is if you want to make those sort of small batch top grade uh, kombuchas, then use, like Adam's using here, a very good quality oolong and green as your base, and then sprinkle in some of the amazing teas on top. Now, sugar, you said refined, right? Now, I, from what I've heard is that actually, if you start to go too much down the other route, mm the SCOBY doesn't like it. The SCOBY actually really exactly. likes just refined sugar, is that exactly. right? Exactly. Actually, the best sugar for kombucha <clears throat> fermentation is your standard kind of British beet sugar, uh, the stuff you just buy really cheap at Tesco's. And, uh, and basically, that doesn't contain the minerals that, say, a, um, a demerara or a turbinado sugar, something like that would, which mm. the minerals in that can confuse the SCOBY and slow down the fermentation process. Okay, so it may be counterintuitive, but most of this sugar is going to be converted anyway exactly. right so it's not a, it's about feeding the scoby what it wants to, yeah. to to consume okay so we've got the water we've got the tea we've got the sugar we've got the scoby and as you said you don't need the scoby necessarily this is what would you call this inoculate or would you call well, it this is technically the scoby it's it's the bacteria and yeast suspended in a liquid form now when you brew kombucha for a period of time that's exactly what happens the uh, the bacteria and yeast become a part of the liquid itself mm. but if you're starting a kombucha brew for the first time i do recommend that you buy the classical yeah. cellulose pellicle as it's called in scientific terms from a website uh, there's a website called happy kombucha that we recommend uh, that actually sells these and with it will come some of this yeah. liquid. It always comes with some liquid in. Exactly. You need to keep that in. Yeah. And when you're doing your brews, we'll talk about that later on, you've obviously got to always keep some of this. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, so you've got all your ingredients. Let's get brewing. What do you do first? All right, the first thing we're gonna do is we're going to fill up this jar. We got a one liter jar here with about basically a quarter of the way with hot water. Now, depending on the tea you're using, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that your water is at the right temperature. Now, our water today is about 80 degrees, which is perfect for the green tea that we're going to use. So I'm gonna fill that up to about a quarter of the way. That should be good there. Now, a mistake that people commonly make is that when they're brewing, say, a one liter batch, they'll fill it to the top with hot water and steep their tea in that. You always, though, want to keep a quarter so that you can cool this hot water down mm. so that when you introduce your SCOBY, it doesn't burn off the bacteria. Right, yeah, of course. So we're just going to plop our tea bags in. For a one liter brew, we're using four grams of tea. So each of these are two grams. Okay, so I'll stop you here, right? So obviously, being a tea head and a gongfu brewing lover, 
I, when I make my kombucha, I will increase the amount. You're brewing this for what, two minutes, three minutes? We're gonna be brewing between three and five minutes. Three and five minutes. So when we do it um, at my place, we'll use probably about, I would say three times the amount of leaf mm -hmm. and we'll be brewing for about two minutes, yep. right? And obviously, again, it's all sort of dependent on your uh, desires in terms of how much you wanna spend on your kombucha because it's gonna cost more money, right? But you know, finding the right point is up to you, but obviously increasing the amount of leaf, reducing the amount of time slightly will produce a more, I would say, complex tea starter to begin with, um, but experiment, of course. Okay, yeah. so three to five minutes. Yeah, and we're just gonna stir that around to make sure we get all of the tea in there. Okay, we've had five minutes here brewing these uh, teas. So you've, it's like a Tieguan Yin, is it? It's yep, a Tieguan, tieguan Yin, yin and, and a, a gunpowder green. Gun powder green. Okay. So this is actually just the gunpowder green that we're using in these tea bags today. Okay. And a green tea is always a good base to start with. Uh, it provides a really nice flavor profile. It has a lot of nutrients that the SCOBY likes. I found from my experimentation that you can use all types of tea, but I found that white tea was the least successful. Mm. Black teas, green teas, green oolong teas, I wouldn't really mess around too much as your base tea with uh, roasted oolongs either. Um, you can use them as a sort of that extra flourish in terms of taste, but really you wanna be focusing on that more straight ahead tea taste. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Okay. So the next step is we're <clears> gonna <throat> pour in our sugar. Now this looks like quite a bit of sugar for a one liter batch, but um, this is 60 grams. This is the same recipe that we use for our big brews, uh, for a commercial style brewing. And we're just gonna dump that in. Now 60 grams of sugar for a one liter brew will leave you at least initially with about 6% sugar which actually isn't that much if you think about it. Your standard Coca-Cola is about 10.6% sugar. And actually, over the two week, <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. Crazy. Over the two week uh, period, that's gonna basically be cut in half. Most of it's gonna be digested by the yeast and then converted by the bacteria into the acids. So okay, just, so sort of final kombucha sugar content, we may as well deal based with that on right this, now. Yeah, based on this recipe, around 3% sugar. So about three 3%. grams per 100 mils. Okay. Now we've just got a super sugary tea solution here. Yeah. And at what temperature does this have to go down to before the SCOBY will be happy? So you want to keep it below 38 degrees. Okay, um, so body temperature. Yeah, so body temperature. Thankfully, this liquid is already reasonably low because we started with about 80 degrees. And what we're going to do next then, and this is cold filtered water. Okay. We're going to pour this in to cool down the tea just to make sure it's at the right temperature. Yeah. And I recommend you do this even if you're doing Gong Fu style. <clears throat> Brew it in a smaller amount of water than you normally would just to get very concentrated brew and then uh, dilute with colder water. So otherwise you're just gonna be waiting around and during that time waiting around, the tea will start to oxidize as well. And then now that <clears throat> that liquid is cool enough, we're just gonna pour that SCOBY directly in there. So if you had the cellulose one, you would just lay that on top and exactly. pour in the, the little bit of starter liquid. That exactly. Comes so we've got that. We're going to stir that to make sure all that bacteria and yeast is dispersed efficiently through the liquid. What I like to do is I like to taste it to get an idea of what it starts, how it starts basically. It's delicious. <laughs> it's really good. It's like an apple juice. It it's incredible. The tartness and acidity of that mm. definitely balances it out. Exactly. Very, very nice. And <clears> then, <throat> one of the most important bits, mm. you want to put your cloth on top. Now you can use anything. You can use a cheesecloth, you can use a J cloth, you can use, well, basically what we use for our large batches are John Lewis bed sheets, which you'll <laughs> see a bit later. <laughs> <clears throat> That's hysterical. You use bed sheets, well, yeah. you can see, you're going to see. Cotton We're going to do another video touring Jar's commercial brewery so you can see everything at a larger scale. Okay, so, but the most important thing is there needs to be oxygen, there needs to be airflow, yeah. but you don't want any sort of uh, contaminants to enter exactly. the, yeah. the booch. Okay, now, all important, temperatures and times. Yeah. What temperature do you store it at? How long do you keep it for? So for our brews, we uh, ferment at around 24 degrees for about 10 days to two weeks, depending on the airflow in the room, different seasons, kind of the kombucha will ferment slightly differently. 
And actually, um, despite using the exact same recipe, tanks on one side of the room will ferment slightly right. differently from a tank on the That's other the side. That's of the, of, uh, the beauty of natural process. Yeah, so, uh, so the optimal temperature, what we found after four and a half years of brewing, is about 25, 24 degrees. Really? Yeah. So if you go, so t let's talk about the dangers of of, of being too cold or too hot? What are the, what, what can happen? So uh, thankfully, because this is properly acidified, uh, there won't be any mold growth. You don't have to worry about any contaminants entering the kombucha because there's so much acetic acid in here that it can kill really anything that goes inside that you don't want. Um, but if you do ferment it too low of a temperature, the fermentation process will take too long or it just won't happen at all. Your okay. kombucha will just stay as it is. Uh, if you ferment it too high of a temperature, the yeast will take precedence right. over the bacteria and yeah. then you get flavors. And that's like. what I've noticed sometimes in some, some kombucha taste. It's got mm. an overly yeasty exactly. aroma. Yeah. You're like, mm, that's just a bit too it's yeasty. A bit too yeah. yeasty. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay. And certainly the, the way that we brew, we're trying to prioritize the bacteria over the yeast and that creates a cleaner flavor, the kombucha will ferment more efficiently. Um, yeah, just overall it will taste better. So is, is it true to say that the bacteria are doing most of the, the sort of hard work at the beginning and then with secondary fermentation, yeast take over or is that? So the yeast actually initially does the work. The okay. yeast gobbles up the sucrose that's in the cane sugar right. and splitting it into fructose and glucose. And now in this symbiotic relationship, the bacteria comes in and gobbles up the fructose and converts that into acetic acid and it gobbles up the glucose and converts that into gluconic acid. Uh -huh. So initially the yeast does the work to convert that sucrose into the fructose and glucose right. and then the bacteria jumps in right. and does its job to create the acids. I see, okay, all right, good, good to know. So now you're leaving it at 24 degrees. When do you decide it's ready? What's your criteria? So for us, uh, basically every day we do qualitative and quantitative testing. So we'll test the pH, we'll test the total acidity, which is the balance of all of the acids together. We'll test the bricks, which is the sugar content. And then we'll do a taste test to determine whether it's you know close to what we'd like to finish on. Generally speaking, kombucha finishes um, around a sugar content of 3% to 4.5%, uh, and the acidity, or the pH, uh, generally is around 3. That's so if you were advising home brewers out there, and you know they don't have all the fancy gear that you have, yeah. apart from taste, which is obviously the key paramount, you know, qualitative uh, deciding factor. What would you say, would a pH meter, would that be the You the, could get the a best? pH meter. Uh, so around three, stopping at around pH three? Exactly, yeah. Anywhere between 2.8 and 3.1 is totally fine. But really, some people prefer their kombuchas at 3.5 or 3.4. It, it Which really means there would be sh more sugary, There'd more sweet. There would be slightly more sugar and slightly less acid. Okay. Um, but for, you know, on the cheap, you can get litmus paper, uh, which you can just dip in your liquid and it will tell you the exact pH. Uh, okay, so now uh, you're, you've pulled off your kombucha. We're going to talk about secondary fermentation a little bit later. But first of all, what's the process for starting a new batch? How do you go about doing that? Because I know some people do continuous batch brewing, some people do fresh batch brewing. What's the difference? So for us, we do kind of a, um, uh, a fresh batch brew every single batch. And that's because the kombucha is a lot more clean. It's also non-alcoholic. Now, if you're doing a continuous brew, which is basically pulling out the liquid that you want to drink for the day and then topping that up with sweet tea. Mm. So your kombucha continuously goes. Um, the levels of alcohol can get up to one and a half, even 2% in some cases. Okay. For us, it's really important that we're creating a non-alcoholic kombucha. And the best way of doing that is to do a single batch ferment. So single batch versus continuous batch, as Adam says, from my understanding, continuous batch is you draw off what you need, you leave the scoby and the starter mm -hmm. and you just add more sweetened tea yeah. um, fresh batch like you're doing it means cleaning out everything yes. starting all afresh yes. how does that affect the look and the health of the scoby because sometimes i've seen some continuous batch brews yeah. and the scoby let's say looks a little bit um worse for wear or it's, <laughs> it looks like a bit of a monster in there yeah i mean uh kombucha brewing generally speaking is not the prettiest thing uh but continuous brew uh Oftentimes, the yeast will will hang in these big strings or it will die off and fall to the bottom, so you get often a darker, cloudier brew. Yeah. When you're doing a single batch, it doesn't give enough time for the yeast to take over, so you often have more clear liquid. Let's take a look at this scope. Yeah, so this is two weeks in. Uh, this is a batch that we did two weeks ago. And you can see the, the layer of the scoby here is, is quite white, yeah. clear. 
uh, the liquid itself is pretty clear um, and that would that's generally what a single batch will look like now if you were to take out a little bit of this and top it up and continue doing that for a month two months the liquid might be a little bit darker it might be a little bit uh, more cloudy you might see more of these more of these yeasty bits. and sometimes the yeasty bits just hang down like tentacles exactly. and yeah. go over the top and yeah it's like a jelly but if you wanted jar. to sort of clean your scoby off then yep. you just do that in in booch, right? So yes, cleaning it in booch or in vinegar, actually. Yeah. Um, generally speaking, when you're cleaning uh, a jar or, or anything that your kombucha is going to be brewed in, you don't want to use antibacterial soap because that can affect the health of the scoby. Mm -hmm. You can use spirit vinegar, you can use apple cider vinegar, um, or you can use boiling water. And whilst we're on the subject of <clears throat> keeping the health of the SCOBY, what is your opinion on metals? I know people get like frantic if you use a metal spoon. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, we get asked that question a lot. Um, generally speaking, stirring your kombucha with a spoon like we have here is completely fine. Um, if you are brewing in stainless steel, which is what we do in our larger batches, we use fermentation grade stainless yeah. steel, which yeah. is made for, for, um, for fermenting wine originally. So that level of, uh, of, of stainless is is uh, completely safe for kombucha brewing but at home you know generally speaking glass is, is ideal okay um, but it's not the end of the world if you use a, a metal spoon to, not to at stir. All. a lot There's of people no get like oh no you if you put metal spoon you kill I the know. kombucha a lot of people think that but no it won't kill the kombucha at all okay and while final subject on scobies Scoby Hotels. Scotels. <laughs> Scotels. <laughs> Talk to me about Scoby Hotels. So if you wanted to take a pause or you had too many Scobies, what's the process there? Yeah, so you can take your Scoby out at any time and you can put it in another jar like this where you keep all your leftover Scobies. Basically, every time you brew, a new layer is going to form and sometimes you have too many of them. Yeah. You just layer them up and you give, give them to, them to friends. friends. Yeah. <laughs> Sell them on eBay, do whatever you want to do. Um, but yeah, they're often referred to as the Scotel. Um, and also, interesting point is at any point that you want to stop your kombucha brew um, you can basically put the lid back on close up the cloth area and put it in the fridge and you can put your your um, kombucha to sleep basically for up to nine months um, and yeah so if, if your housemates get angry that it smells like vinegar or it's too freaky looking or you're just tired of brewing you can basically just put it to sleep in the fridge at any point so while the scoby's in there you just sort of yep. close it up yeah just close and it up this there. scotel you put vinegar over it or just more yeah kombucha? so more kombucha or uh, or you know basically you would just leave it in either vinegar or finish and kombucha. seal the top in that one uh, as well you can either leave it with the cloth on or you can seal it it's but totally cold, up to you. cold temperature better otherwise um, it will start to yeah if you leave it too warm of a temperature it will continue to ferment yeah. right okay all right so I hope that answers all your questions about how to keep your SCOBY nice and healthy as Adam said they don't actually don't use the SCOBY you use yeah. the liquid starter which is something that a lot of people don't realize but if you're making good booch then you know you can just use the liquid yeah um, and the, he's found some inventive ways to use the SCOBYs but we'll talk about yeah. that in a little bit okay so now we've got our, our, our booch let's talk about secondary fermentation yeah, so secondary fermentation is the process by which you introduce extra fructose, so in the form of fruit juice or fresh fruit, um, and you can basically create natural fizz. Uh, now the easiest way of doing that is just to get a soda stream, <laughs> and you can carbonate it immediately, yeah. mix it with fruit juice. But if you want to do it the natural, old-fashioned way, what you can do is you can basically take your finished kombucha, so say in two weeks time, your kombucha, you taste it one day, you've tested the pH, it tastes perfect. What you initially want to do is save some of that finished kombucha to use as starter liquid for your next batch. Mm -hmm. But then the leftover kombucha that you have there, you're, you're ready to drink basically. And what you can do is you want to get a swing top bottle, uh, like a Grolsch style bottle yeah. or even our jar kombucha bottles, which uh, can withstand quite a bit of pressure. Yeah. And what you want to do is you want to pour your finished kombucha into one of these jars with a little bit of headspace. And you can either chop up some fruit, say some pineapple, you can chuck some berries in there, or you can pour juice in there. Yeah. And you'll put the top on. And you want to leave that then at the same temperature that you were brewing your kombucha at uh, for around three days. And each day in the morning, you want to pop open that top and let out the excess CO2. Yeah, make sure you burp it, otherwise yeah. it could get, yeah, could then you get, get dangerous. Yeah, exploding bottles. Uh, yeah. We've definitely had some booch blown in our faces before. <laughs> really? Yeah, uh, in the early days. But, so um, you're keeping it at 24 degrees? Yes. Yeah. And then once you've 
achieve the right sort of fizz level mm -hmm. is that when it goes into the fridge yes ex like basically at that point you can taste it so i would taste it every day to see how the fizz is coming along and then when it tastes perfect you can just put the lid on put it in the fridge and you've got your carbonated flavored food. and how does adding sugar fructose um, afterwards affect alcohol levels so that is when the alcohol levels will rise a bit more so um it's a bit difficult when you're doing it that way at home during a secondary fermentation because the yeast is converting some of that fructose into co2 yeah. It's also converting that into ethanol. Um, and the easiest way of, of basically keeping down the alcohol levels is to do that with something like a soda stream. Mm. Um, to, I don't want to call it artificially carbonating because you're basically using the same compound, which is CO2 yeah, to CO2. produce a liquid. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but that's the easier way of doing it. But if you're doing it the, the natural way, the kombucha alcohol levels can go up a little bit, yeah. Okay, well, up to you. If you want a little bit more of an alcoholic booch, then of course that's up to you. So there we go. That's how you make kombucha as instructed by the kombucha master himself, Adam from JAR. As I said though, there's no harm in experimenting, yeah, right? Absolutely. In fact, experimentation is very, very good. I didn't know that you were making kombucha out of fig leaves, for example, <laughs> so I'm excited to taste that. Right, we're gonna also do a couple of other videos. We're gonna be doing a video about the JAR brewery itself, touring a commercial kombucha brewery, and we're gonna be doing a video all about the health effects of kombucha. We'll be putting links to those videos in the description below. But apart from that, thank you, Adam. Thanks for having me. I'm, uh, I'm raring to taste more of your booch, and uh, we're gonna go and have a tour of your, of your brewery now. That's it, Tea Heads. Check out our other videos, Taste Our Teas, wherever you are in the world, by visiting mayleaf.com, and come visit us if you're ever in London. Other than that, this is Adam. I'm Don from Mayleaf. Thank you for being a part of the revelation of true tea. Stay away from those tea bags, keep drinking the good stuff, and spread the word, because nobody deserves bad tea. Bye. See you guys.